right, we'll go ahead and get started at 7 o'clock. Nobody wants to sit by Shane, so I guess he didn't bathe the day. So <laughs> Let's start with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all that you do for us, and we thank you uh, for allowing us and permitting us to live in a place in which we can gather so freely in your name. I pray that we will never take uh, such opportunities for granted, and as we continue to learn how to pray, and as we begin now to learn how to pray for others and for uh, the world around us, I pray that you will be our guide and help us not only to learn, but also to put into practice uh, what we learn, that we become doers and not just hearers of your word, in Christ's name, amen. All right, so we're going to start now. This is the last section called Movement Outward. So during this series, uh, of which you can find all of them, um, almost all of them, I think we missed one or two because of technical difficulties on uh, either Facebook or YouTube, and I have in the YouTube channel put everything in playlists so they're a little bit easier to find, and so that you can do that. And uh, so first we learned how to pray uh, inward in the sense of asking God to transform us, asking God to change us, uh, to make us more aware of our own sin. And, you know, basically in that sense, you're pursuing holiness. And then, uh, then we begin to pray upward in which we're adoring God because now that we've removed ourselves from the equation, he is first and to worship him the way we should and to seek him for him, not just the things that we need. And now we're, you know, now that you've done that, you're ready to move outward in prayer and pray for the world around us. And it does make sense that we do that, that first we have to become aware of who we are, uh, asking God to, you know, search our hearts, uh, transform us, change us, make us the people who, who he wants us to be, where we want his will for our life. And then uh, we begin to seek him, not for what he can do, but for who he is. And then as we begin to be transformed, it's just a natural transition that as we get closer to God, we desire to move outward in, 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 uh, in our prayer. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that with just a short introduction of this. Uh, both our transformation through inward prayer and our intimacy with God through upward prayer propels us outward for ministry. To me, one of the key indications that we are not growing in our relationship with God and that we're not getting closer to him is that we don't want to do ministry or we get tired of doing ministry. A person who is maintaining a relationship with God as he is pouring in them should not be able to lose interest or desire to pour that out. Uh, because I think the more that you're growing in Christ, the more that you're, you're being transformed, the more you want to pass that along to other people. And so as a key indication when we're getting in trouble spiritually is when we're getting tired ministerially because it means that we're not taking back in. In a sense, we're not filling the cup back up. Uh, one of the things that I've kind of just come to accept, you know, in ministry is that Sunday afternoon and Monday should be hard uh, in the sense that you've emptied yourself. You've emptied yourself spiritually. You've, you've preached the word. You've poured out what God has put in you during the week, and then you have to go back to the fountain to fill back up. And there should be that sense of thirst, if you will, to go back to God and for that experience. And what happens, though, a lot of times in ministry is we don't go back. Uh, we pour out, but then we don't fill the cup back up, and eventually we start to dry up. We begin to get tired. We begin to get frustrated. We begin to get, you know, lots of other things, and we need to be really careful of that. Uh, but sanctification, holiness, spiritual transformation is not just for us. It is also for others. Not only, I mean, because if you look at the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is to be passed along. It is to be seen. It is to be shared. It is to be partaken of, if you will, and you're only going to do that with others. Uh, the gifts of the Spirit, they're not for us. They're not for my personal glorification or my personal use. They're to be for other people and to edify the body of Christ. And so our sanctification is also so that others will see Christ in us, that we can be an example and help lead people to Christ in that way. We are not only to experience God's love, but we're supposed to share it. And that is one of the characteristics of love, that if we have genuine uh, love, genuine love for God, you should want to share it. 
okay? And we've talked about this before. It's why the Trinity created, okay? Uh, when, you know, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, before they created anything, they existed. They existed in a perfect, loving relationship with one another. Their only purpose into creating the world was to share that love. Okay? Because love desires to be shared. And so as we experience God's love in our own life, we will desire to, desire to share that love with other people in our life. Genuine love received always yearns to be shared. Uh, the world is blind. It's in pain from its own ignorance and selfishness. And Christians full of the love of God can make a difference and uh, be that salt of the earth that we need to be. Okay? Now, when we try to minister in our own strength, we are insufficient at best or totally ineffective at worst. And anyone who's been in ministry can testify what it's like when you've stopped going to the fountain. And uh, whether that's a, you know, a professional clergy like a pastor, a missionary, or whatever, or a Sunday school teacher, or anything else, any other type of ministry, or any Christian's ministry, all Christians are supposed to be involved in ministry. Uh, ministry flows from abundance, from our transformation by God and our intimacy with God. So as he is changing us and we're cultivating relationship with him, ministry flows from that. Okay? Uh, and a way that we talk about this, you abide to bear fruit, being before doing. Okay? And so uh, I think in our nation specifically, and I think it's kind of a problem worldwide, but I think specifically in our cultural mindset, it's always doing, 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 doing. But doing ministry is not the same thing as being with God. Okay? Even in, mission, in, in like sermon preparation, while there is an aspect of that in which you're kind of wrestling with God and, and, and dealing with God and what to share and what to preach, it is not the same thing as when you're sitting before God saying, you know, who are you and who am I and I need you to change me and transform me and I want to draw closer to you and be more intimate with you. But a lot of people, and I think a lot of pastors specifically, they're doing stuff all the time, but I think many of them very, very, very rarely are actually ever spending time with God. And that's why we're seeing the burnout, and I mean real burnout, and that's why you're seeing massive amounts of ministers leave the ministry. Uh, in America, it's at a rate that has never been seen before in the history of the church of pastors leaving the ministry. I think I saw a statistic, I think it was like 75% of pastors said if they could, they would do something else. That if they could, if they could get a job in the secular world, they would leave the church in order to, you know, to, to just make money or whatever. Because, and I think a lot of that comes because they're not spending time with God. Uh, I don't see how it could not be. Because if you're spending time in the transformational presence of God and you're having an intimate relationship with God, He is going to fill you to the point you wouldn't give up. And I think that's why we're seeing it. It's not to criticize them or it's also not to excuse them. Uh, because if you're called, there is no repentance from a call. Uh, you must fulfill that call. And so we have to be really, really careful. But no matter if you're a pastor or not, your ministry to your family, your ministry to your neighbors and to your colleagues at work and will flow from your intimate, personal, transformational relationship with Christ. If you don't have that, you will not be an effective witness. Uh, now, it doesn't mean that someone can't come to Christ through you because they don't come through you anyway. Uh, and God's graceful, and he uses us sometimes in spite of ourselves. But the more that we stay in the presence of God, the more that we are in a relationship with him, the more we become salt and the more we become light and reflect his nature into the world around us where people see him and they don't see us. A quote uh, from Bernard of Clairvaux. He said, If you are wise, you will show yourself rather as a reservoir than as a canal. For a canal spreads abroad as it receives it, but a reservoir waits until it is full before overflowing, and thus communicates without loss to itself its superabundant water. In the church at the present day, we have many canals and few reservoirs. And I really, really like that quote. And, and, and you've got to realize when that was written, it was a really long time ago. 
Uh, I, I think if some of these people live today, they would be shocked at how much worse it is than when they were actually writing. John 15, and you know, we've talked about this a lot. A lot. Remain in me. That, that is the word where we get abide. Abide in me as I remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So what is that basically saying? If I abide in Christ, I'll be fruitful. Why? Because he will fill me. And it will overflow. If I don't, I won't be fruitful. And no matter what ministerial success I think I have in the eyes of God, it is not fruit. Okay? Uh, you can pastor a church and your church can run you know, 10,000 people. And if the pastor isn't abiding, that is not the fruit of the pastor, okay? Uh, it is various things that it could be. God's grace, compromise of truth, uh, or the congregational uh, aspect of, of, of church growth because the, the congregation is what makes a church grow. Anyway, so the pastor can kill it, but he can't make it grow. All right, so the first prayer in the outward prayer movements that we're going to talk about is the prayer of the ordinary, Okay, and so uh, this is just basically what it sounds like, praying in the ordinary things of life, right? The heresy of our day is that most people separate their few Christian activities from the rest of their life, and by doing so, they can make no spiritual sense of most of their life. Most people, when they go to work, they don't see that as part of their Christian life, when they go to the supermarket, they don't see that as part of their Christian life. When they're sitting around having dinner with their family, they don't see that as part of their Christian life. And this is what we call the heresy of our day. That we actually think that we can be Christians part of the time. Either we are fully Christians or we are not Christians at all. And if we are fully Christians, then Christianity should affect every aspect of our life. Now, you know, working with Muslims, one, I, one of the things that interests me about Islam is how it affects every aspect of their life, the way they dress, the way they eat, the way they interact with other people. Every aspect of their life is somehow affected by Islam. And, and one of the reasons it makes it so difficult when you're evangelizing a Muslim is when they come to Christ trying to separate what is purely Islamic and what is just their own personal devotion because it's so intermingled. But with, you know, with a Christian, it's like, here's my Christian life, with Western Christians specifically, here's my Christian life, here is my every other life, and that we separate it, we categorize it. That, oh, that has nothing to do with my Christian life. That is my job or that is my finances or that is my family. You know, I don't have to raise my kids the way the Bible says because that is a separate issue, not according to Scripture. And I think that's one of the things that we could actually learn from some of these other faiths is to integrate our faith with every aspect of our life. You say, well, okay, let's take it. In Islam, you cannot eat pork. All right, so uh, how, can you, how can you take Christianity and affect how we eat? There is a ways. What does the Bible talk about eating? Well, one, Jesus said, you can eat pretty much anything because it just goes into the, you know, the bathroom when you get through. I mean, you know, that's a paraphrase, the trough, if you want to say it his way. Uh, however, it does talk about that we can glorify God in what we eat. It does talk about that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit and that we should care, you know, about what we eat. Uh, how we, how our marriages, we have plenty in Scripture to tell us about how we should conduct our marriages. It doesn't go into cultural issues, Okay. Uh, but, okay, for a man to love his wife as Christ loves the church. I guarantee you, if a man loves his wife as Christ loves the church, and the woman loves him as Jesus loves the church, or if you want to take the whole submission, and submission doesn't mean putting her underneath, not at all, what marriage is going to break up if that's happening? None. You know, two, two Christians are not going to you know, go down the wrong path if that is happening. Even before marriage, where we're told not to unevenly yoke ourselves with an unbeliever or with someone from another faith, 
I mean, how many people are in a bad situation because they didn't take the advice of Scripture? And that's you know, kind of what we were talking about Sunday with God's counsel. And so we can integrate our entire life and our Christian faith together. How we raise children, lots of guidance. And, but when you look around the church, and I'm not talking about the world, when you look around the church, there are many, many, many people who are not following the simple guidelines of Scripture in marriage, in, ch- in child raising, in finances, and in other aspects of their life. And so they've separated it to the, this is my spiritual life because I want to go to heaven, and this is the rest of my life where I want to do what I want. I don't think when we stand before God, that's going to go over very well. And so we need to include God in every aspect. We have uh, lived this way for so long, we don't even see the contradiction. I guarantee you, most parents or most spouses or most even people in their finances don't even see the contradiction that's there when they say, Jesus is the Lord of my life. Oh, yeah? Jesus is the Lord of your life? Well, what about your finances? Do you pay your tithes and offerings? What about your marriage? Do you love your wife as Christ loved the church? Do you have that relationship that God expects? I mean, when you look at the Bible and what it says about marriage, when people look at your marriage and my marriage, they should see Christ in our marriage. They should see that, okay? Jesus being the the groom, the church being the bride, that relationship, that's why it's compared. That relationship should reflect the glory of God. How many of us can say our marriages reflect the glory of God? And our marriages by themselves are a testimony to the grace of Jesus Christ. Our children, okay? One of the things that shocks me with with our children is, okay, as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, there are certain things that if I do them, I will lose my credentials, okay? they, They will be taken away. But in the same list that they look at those things of what, I, what my credentials should be removed from, one of them says that if my children are not behaved, I, do, I, I should not be a leader in the church. Now, <laughs> I don't know about your, your experience, but I know a lot of ministers who should have their credentials taken away if we're going to follow the guidelines of Scripture, that they should not be leaders because of their children. I mean, in my experience, most of the pastor's kids were horrible. Uh, I could tell you about pastor's kids that I had, but we won't go that far because that would reveal too much about me as well. So, uh, no, actually, when I was 12 years old, my brother paid the 17-year-old pastor's daughter to teach me how to kiss when I was 12, okay? Uh, we, I won't say what pastor it was. I had about eight, so uh, had about eight in like 14 years. But. The heresy of our day is 5% spirituality. That the average North American person claiming to be a born-again Christian, we're not talking about Catholics, even though you can't make that distinction, born-again Christian is a Christian, but their life, only 5% of their life is impacted by their faith. Only 5 Please tell me how that can be true And we expect to stand before a holy God and hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. If it doesn't affect my marriage, it doesn't affect how I raise my kids, it doesn't affect how I use my finances, it doesn't affect how I live my life, how I treat other people, it doesn't affect those things. But that, and honestly, I would say that's probably a high 5%. Uh, So we need to be aware But the way we overcome this heresy is through the praying of the ordinary. And we can do this in three ways. Number one is we can turn ordinary experiences of life into prayer. What do you mean? Everything. Everything. Okay? You go to the post office. (laughs) I don't know. Pray you don't get a bill (laughs) in the mail. Pray if you get a bill, thank you, God, that I have the finances to pay this bill. Or, God, please help me to have the finances to pay this bill. Okay, thanks, thank, Thanksgiving is a prayer. Request is a prayer. Uh, praying that, you know, if, if you're walking in the post office here, I don't think I've ever been in the, Ken, even though we're in a really small town, I've never been in the Kincaid post office where there wasn't other people there. Uh, and so it's a thing of pray for those people, okay? 
Thank, thank God that you can walk into the post office. Why? Because there's people who can't. There's just so many different things. When you're at the supermarket, pray before you go in. God, if you want me to encounter someone in here, if you have a door for me, for me to be a light, for me to be salt, please help me to see it. Okay? Why not pray that? You say, but I just got to go in there and get some milk. Wouldn't it be an awesome thing, though, to lead someone to Christ and buy milk at the same time? Or encourage someone while you're buying milk. Again, thanking God for cows and that you can drink milk, that you're not lactose intolerant. I mean, there's just so many different things. And you're, th you're thinking, well, what does this do? Well, at first, it's going to feel incredibly awkward that everything you're doing, you're interacting with God with. But after time, it will become normal. And then suddenly that 5% will be at 10%, 20%, and then suddenly, hopefully, 100% spirituality in your life. Another thing that you can do is you can see God in ordinary experiences. <laughs> now, I know when people see me in the store, they try to hide or go the other direction. But you ever think that God might have put me there and vice versa? Uh, especially if you're in a hurry. You know, you don't want to run into the pastor or anything like that. Uh, uh, trust me, if we're in a supermarket, we're not going to have a long, extensive conversation. But I will say this. I also, I see, I'm very observant. So I usually do see you, whether you think I see you or not. Uh, but seeing him, seeing him in your job, seeing him in cooking dinner for your family, seeing him in... Uh, I don't know, if you do tea in the afternoon or coffee in the afternoon, just that moment of, wow, just time of rest in which I can just sit down and relax uh, and enjoy a little bit of the day. See him in uh, the, the creatures of the earth, the weather, I mean, everywhere. I mean, one of the things, uh, our, 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 we have a treadmill, and on our treadmill, you look right outside in the backyard. And a lot of times I'm on that treadmill, I just watch, we have a, like a colony of squirrels which I think is all over Kincaid, uh, in the backyard and just sitting there watching them play. You know, sometimes when I'm on the treadmill and you're thinking, you know, God knows what that squirrel is doing. He takes care of that squirrel. You know, and, he, you know, God, the Bible says he feeds the sparrow. So what are we worried about? And uh, another thing is praying through the ordinary experiences of life. So turning, them into, turning our life into a prayer by looking for them, seeing them, and interacting with God through them. And again, eventually, what feels so awkward will become a lifestyle. Okay? I see Head still looking at the screen, so I'm waiting. I've been in enough classrooms to see when people are still writing, hopefully. Usually I ignore it, but... Okay, so God created the heavens and the earth, and he said it was very good, okay? Do we ever look around and see that it's very good? Okay, not the mess that we've made of it. I ain't talking about that, but, I mean, the beauty. I mean, I'm, I, I remember, I forget, when I first came to Illinois, the thing that really stood out to me, okay, the corn hadn't, you know, went up and everything yet, but it's how big the sky looks here. I mean, it's, I mean, because, you know, I live in a place, you know, in, in Alabama with all mountains and stuff, and then in, <laughs> and, and then in the UAE, buildings, <laughs> and so, you didn't, and then the, the sky had sand in it, so you didn't really see a whole lot, but when I came here, I was like, wow, the sky is so big, you can, it's like you could see forever, you know, and, but do we see God in that? I remember the first day we were driving in, we were, I, I forget what that little town is called, after we get off the interstate, but there was a bald eagle, and I hadn't seen a bald eagle probably in years, uh, you know, was flying around, and, you know, just things like that, and to, to connect them with God and his creation. The Bible is almost casual in the fact that God created the heavens and the earth, and it pretty much said, well, it does say, and if you don't think so, you're a fool, okay? Uh, <laughs> And so we realize how many foolish people there are in the world who actually think that this just happened. Uh, I mean, to me, that's beyond comprehension. That is not a sign of an intelligent mind. That's a sign of someone who's just stupid. Okay? That you, I mean, even think this could all just happen. And uh, you know, we won't go into the whole concepts of evolution, 
but it's a thing of when you just look, when you just look merely at the human body, there is no way to believe that. Did you know like the most sensitive thing in all of creation on earth is the human fingertip? Of what you can, the, what you can actually sense that touches your fingertip. And, and how it sends a signal up to, you know, for most of us, our brain. And lets us know, I just touched something. And it was hot or it was cold or, you know, it's just, I don't know, I, I find it fascinating. But through the incarnation, God took the spiritual and intertwined it with the material, with human flesh, that God became human flesh. And uh, he sanctified the common and the ordinary through the incarnation of Jesus. Now, I want you to think about the birth as we're we're approaching Christmas. He didn't do it in anything spectacular. Uh, The birth of Jesus is not heroic. It's not, he didn't use the famous or the powerful. He used a poor couple from Nazareth. Uh, nobodies. Okay? And everybody, I mean, most people in the world, okay, know who Mary is because of that. And she was a nobody. Okay? Uh, even Muslims believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. So it's a thing of, you know, it's, it's, that name is so well known, and that's who God chose. He used the poor, he used the simple, and he used the ordinary. God cares about the ordinary. Mary and Joseph is, you know, part of it. The shepherds, why include them? I mean, they smell. They have to smell. You spend all day with sheep, you're going to smell. Uh, why, why include them? Why not, you know, bring in the wise men earlier? Hey, give them, you know, a message, hey, we don't want the shepherds showing up because they're kind of stinky, you know, and that kind of stuff. And they don't really bring good gifts you know, so we don't want to invite them. Let's get these wise men and make, you know, just let them show up. No, the shepherds were the first ones who got to celebrate the birth. And then even the place of birth. Now, we can argue. Uh, I personally do not believe that Jesus was born in a stable. Uh, when you look at, you know, the Palestinian culture of that time and what houses looked like and how they were framed and everything. Uh, when it, I also don't believe that when they talk about there was no room in the end, it's talking about a hotel. Uh, in a Palestinian home at that time, would uh, you'd have the main quarters, but then sometimes, not every house, some houses would have a side room. It was a guest room, and it was called the inn. So when Mary and Joseph knocked on the door of these different houses, sorry, the inn is full. There's already a guest in that room. And, uh, and also, Mary is about to pop. In what culture in the world? Now, today, that, that might be a different, uh, harder question to answer. But I can't think of a culture in the world. If an eight-month-year-old, an eight-month pregnant woman shows up at your house, she's ready to give birth any moment, you're going to say, nah, go sleep in the barn. I don't think many people would do that today. I hope nobody in our church would do that. And... Back then, that would have been unheard of. And these were children, descendants of David. That's why they were in Bethlehem, to be counted. And everybody would have known that. But anyway, God chose the ordinary. The discovery of God lies in the ordinary and daily things of our life. You know, sometimes we as Pentecostals can be so guilty of wanting miracles and wonders uh, I don't, I'm not so sure that we don't listen to the warnings of Jesus saying only a corrupt and evil generation desires a sign. Uh, but we're always thinking about that. We're always trying to, you know, these, you know, you know, to, to, to build up, you know, these, and we can see God in everything. I mean, I remember when I held Leandra uh, the first time, you know, when she was born. My my my, whole, my thought was just all about. The wonders of God. Uh, and we should be able to see him in everything we do because he's there in everything we do. Remember, God is in us. We are in him. Union with Christ. That union is both spiritual and literal. And so he is with us everywhere we go. So when you're buying milk at Walmart, Jesus is there through the Holy Spirit who lives in you. Okay, He's there. He hears the conversation 
you have or don't have. He also hears the thought of that person you're trying to avoid in Walmart. Or he hears, you know, when Jim's walking around Walmart waiting for Penny, thinking, I wish you'd hurry up, I wish you'd hurry up. He hears that too. <laughs> I don't know if he thinks that or not. Uh, but. <laughs> That's, that's a good point. Uh, for those online, Jim said, I think many times we find the extraordinary in the ordinary. And I think if we're looking, you know, if, if, if we actually take time to look. And, and I think that's one thing about our rushed lifestyle. And again, you know, we live in, a, I, mean, I live in a small town and a small village, uh, you know, here. And compared to many places in the world, this is very, very slow life. But I still feel it's a rushed life in the sense that people don't stop and enjoy things uh, uh, like they should and, uh, you know, that our phones control us and the screens control us and that we don't just enjoy the moment. Uh, I, I, you know, I, a lot of people that I've been around, uh, I can tell if it's silent for more than about two minutes, they get uncomfortable. Uh, you know, that they, they're not really comfortable with silence and, you know, you can't I don't, sometimes I don't think you can acknowledge that God's presence is there if, if every now and then you're not silent. But yeah, I mean, I think the thing when we start to, to realize, to me, when you realize that God is in the ordinary, it is extraordinary that he cares. Uh, you know, and I've shared this before, you know, the first time that Carrie and I went to the Grand Canyon and it was really foggy and everything. And, you know, we was driving from Fresno to Alabama after the whole issue of burning out in China and you know, trying to piece our lives back together again. So we thought we'll take this, this, this five- to six-day drive back to Alabama to see a little bit of America. And we went to the Grand Canyon, and it was so foggy, you couldn't see the biggest hole in the world, you know. And, I mean, you couldn't see nothing. And we stayed there about two or three hours, and it was just so foggy. And, and then we said, well, we'll, 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 just, we'll just go. And uh, we said, well, we'll pray. And we prayed a prayer, you know, God. And we, this was our prayer, basically, you, can, you know, to this, to this extent. This is a stupid prayer. I mean, we actually pray, God, this is a stupid prayer. But we really like to see this. We want to see your creation. And so if you would let the fog lift, we'll take a few pictures, and then we'll leave. Carrie went to the bathroom. Well, I would say five minutes, but usually it takes her longer than five minutes. Any, any period of time, she, and when she came out, the sky was clear. And we took pictures, and I can show you some of them. There's rainbows inside the Grand Canyon. I mean, you're looking down on a rainbow. Uh, and I took, I think, I think I took like 27 rolls of film. That's when you actually have to take rolls of film. So, uh, and no one will ever convince me, no one ever will convince me God didn't do that so that I and Carrie could see the Grand Canyon. And, and there's multiple things in my life in which I could tell he cared about the little things. Uh, uh, I, I've shared this before too. I remember, you know, when I, one of the times when I was first here and we were really kind of struggling, and I, and I was struggling with this whole thing. You know, God, should I move on from this whole abide thing? Even though I, I, I you know, I've been doing this, you know, my whole ministry, and I really believe in this, and I, I really need, I really need a sign for you to to let me know. And then Carrie lets me know that, you know, I think uh, we got a package, and uh, it's, and it's, you can go to my house and look on the front step. Someone sent us a doormat. And you open the doormat, opened it up, and it says, abide, in big letters. Same day. And I'm thinking, got the point, okay? Uh, and so we finally did find out who sent that to us, though. But, it, you know, it's a thing of uh, someone who no, had no idea that I preached that. So it is uh, interesting. But anyway... For those online, Penny was talking about that, that God doesn't think our prayers are stupid, no matter how small or insignificant, and that when we don't pray them, we're actually robbing him from the opportunity of blessing us and ourselves in, in having that. And I, and, I, and I think that's really kind of the point, is I think sometimes we think, well, he, he's too busy. He's God. <laughs> you know, 
somebody? It ain't like he's like, oh, come on, you know, <laughs> I, I got a meeting in 15 minutes. I got to make. No, he's not like us. He doesn't brush people off. He can give you, you, personally, his full attention all day long and do that to the other 1.5 billion Christians on earth, okay? Anyone who calls out in his name at any particular time, he is so big, he is so great, he can give them his full attention at that moment, even if it's about something small, okay? And he cares because, and let me just say this too, a person who really wants to get to know you, I, f- I find it easy to get to know the good side of people because I think because, I don't know if it's because of social media, it's always been this way maybe, we always want to show the good, okay? I mean, if everybody lived their Facebook life, we would all just be sitting around laughing and be happy and eating really great meals all the time. Uh, you know, we, don't, we never see a, you know, a picture of Vienna sausage in a pack of crackers, you know, <laughs> look at what I'm eating for lunch. You know, you don't see those kind of pictures on Facebook. Uh, but, you know, it, it's a thing of we only share the good things or the big things with people. And I'm convinced if you don't share me your pain, then I don't know you, that I want that. I want to know what hurts. I want to know what makes you afraid. I want to, you know, and that was a, you know, a, a really big struggle we had over there because that was very cultural that you didn't share those kind of things, but you don't know someone. God wants to know us. You say, well, God knows everything about us. Yes, he does, but he loves for us to talk to him, okay? Now, I love it when Leander and Kendra talk to me about anything in their life, no matter how small, okay? Even if I don't understand it, okay? Even if I don't even know why it's important, you know, I still want to hear about it. God is a much, much better father than I am, infinitely amount of better father than I am. He wants to hear every aspect of our life, and he wants us to share why he wants us to talk. He wants that. He wanted it so much, he created us for that. Knowing, again, that we would sin, and he's created us anyway, knowing that Jesus, one member of the Trinity, would have to come, become human, die, and, you know, for us to be redeemed and become his children, to have that. He went through all of that, and he don't want to hear about the little things in my life. He don't want to hear about, you know, God, I'm, 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 I'm lazy. I, I don't want to go to church tonight. Can you kind of motivate me a little bit? Can you kind of help me? Uh, you know, I, I'm not feeling good. Can you heal me? You say, well, do, should you pray about anything? Why not? No, I don't necessarily think you should share it on a prayer request. You know, if I, if I, if I get a hangnail, I, you know, and I start, please pray for me, you know. Then, and, and I do know people who are like that, but I keep thinking, I might not care, but he does. You know, he does. He cares about every aspect of our life. And maybe just because we are so selfish, we don't care about other people that way, that we can't relate to him in that sense, that he actually cares about these things. But he does everything. So we can share the ordinary with him. At our home, when we're at the store, when we're at work, when we're commuting, everything. Maybe you hate your job. Talk to God about it. God, I hate this job. I know I probably shouldn't. I should probably just appreciate it because I prayed a whole lot. And then you gave me this job and then I hate it. And I don't want to feel that way. Or if, you know, and, and, you know, maybe you want me to have a different job. Then let me help, let me, let me, help me to know that or either make me content in this job. I don't like my boss. You know, they're, they're grumpy and they're ill. and they're, they, you know, Help me to, to see something in them that makes me care about their final destination in eternity. Uh, one thing that I've always found, if someone really, really drives you nuts, find out about the bad things in their life. Because usually you'll find out why they are the way they are. It doesn't always justify it, but sometimes you can find it out. But if we cannot find God in these little places, we will not find him at all. And I'm going to say that again. If you can't find God in the ordinary you will not find God. I'm always amazed. I mean, I've been to Israel many, many, many times. And I'm always amazed, uh, you know, hearing these people on the plane and all these little people going over to Israel looking for God. 
They're, I mean, and, and a lot of people spend a lot of money to find God. And I'm thinking, you could have found him in your bathroom. You could have found him in your tiny little church, in your tiny little town. You could have found him out in your front yard or sitting in your car. He's there. But yet you spent $3,000 to fly halfway around the world to stand by old rocks thinking he's there and not here. And now I'll say this. If you ever have a chance, go. Because it, it really, I mean, I've said this before, it brings the Bible to life. But you're not going to find God there. You're not going to stand in Jerusalem and think, Woo! you know, it's so much more, you know, like heaven's going to shine down on you and angels are going to start circling you. No. Because if you really understand things, when you're, if you're in Jerusalem, all you feel is hate. You can feel the tension in the air. Uh, he's just as much in Kincaid as he ever, ever been in Jerusalem. And so we need to understand and look for him everywhere. Our entire life should be spiritual and seen through the reality of Emmanuel, that he is with us, in us our union with him. Whether we're at play or recreation, whatever that is, I mean, even as bad as golf, uh, Jim's golf swing is, God is even there when he's golfing. And he's not even laughing at him. <laughs> I'm just kidding. His, his swing is... <laughs> he might laugh every now and then. I'm sure the angels get a tickle every now and then. Uh, no, anything that we do, uh, he's with us. Whether you're fishing, golfing, uh, whatever women do, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, I don't want to give any examples because I don't want to be, uh, what? I don't really know. When Leandra's right, working on her book, God's there. Everything. I'm sorry, I just had visuals that I hope go away. Because so. I heard about the rum cake. So. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I, I, I was angry that Carrie didn't bring me back any. So, uh, Also, family. <laughs> now, I know some of you think, oh, you don't know my family. God might not be there. No, he is. And he's planted a light in that family. And that light is you. Meals, how easy it is for us in our rushed little world to grab a sandwich and go, not realizing God made the wheat that made the bread or the animal that's the meat, you know, the meat in there, or the vegetables, or that he provided the money to buy that sandwich, uh, that we have a properly working digestive system that he cares. Okay? Now, why he doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't you know, feed us like he does the sparrows, but every time you buy a meal, Every time you cook a meal, he's provided it, and it is somewhere to see him. Marriage. Uh, I know, again, for some of you whose spouses are not saved, that can be hard. But, you know, and even if the mistake was made of entering into the relationship, uh, knowing that that person wasn't saved, it's done now. You are the light in that family. Uh, sex. Now, I know uh, that's a hard one. God made it. He made it pleasurable for a reason. And it's not just to have babies. And that is a gift. Uh, I remember, you know, in the UAE in Dubai, we had a, a good friend of mine from Florida. He's a Christian psychologist. He came over and did a marriage uh, thing for us. And, you know, the Middle East, you don't talk about that. Most cultures outside of America, you don't talk about that. <laughs> and he just ignored that all and was very direct. And it really blessed people. Because I think sometimes we pretend like Christians don't have sex. Uh, this, you know, this, you know, our children just you know, pop up out of the ground or something. And, uh, but that is a gift. And even in that, and then our church, our, our church members after he left started calling that time devotion time. Because you know? he, he used that illustration that, you know, that, that is, that, 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 and I know that, and don't, you know, take this somewhere it shouldn't go. He sings over that. That is his gift. When a husband and wife are engaged in a loving, 
He sings over that. That is a beautiful thing to him. He made us that way. Uh, of course, worship, eating and drinking. The Bible says, eat and drink to the glory of God. Sleeping, even in our sleep. You remember that? I don't know if you prayed that prayer when you was a kid. You know, lay me, Lord, lay me down to sleep. Pray, my Lord, my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, which is always a weird thing to pray for a kid. You know, but I mean, you think about it. When you're sleeping, God's watching you. He's watching you. Okay, our life should be prayer. We have often forgotten that Jesus spent most of his life in a manual labor job. Jesus was not an administrative assistant to the high priest, okay? He was not, you know, a liaison to the general overseer. He was a carpenter, okay? For most of his earthly life, he built stuff. Uh, and he still was every bit God. When he was making a table or whatever he would have built, he was God. And he did it all to God's glory and for and in communication with his head and the Father. So if Jesus can build furniture and glorify God as a carpenter, then we can as school teachers, bus drivers, nurses, you know, whatever our job may be for his glory. Jesus didn't wait until he retired from carpentry to start his ministry and connect with his father. He did it through what he was doing on earth. He was as connected to God as much as a carpenter working on a piece of furniture as he was when he was walking across the water or or raising Lazarus from the dead. He was just as much connected to God, and so can we. Many see their life as a hindrance to prayer. And it's just the contrary. I don't have time. I work too much. Too many activities. Pray during them. Communicate with God during them. Prayer is not just another duty in our busy schedule. Prayer should be our life. Talking to God should be our life. And I promise you, when you start talking to Him through the ordinary, the intimate times will be so much more meaningful. Praying the ordinary is not a hindrance, it is a blessing. When we start praying about our job, we start seeing our job differently. When we see that God did not just give us that job to provide us money, that God gave us that job so that we could be salt and light in that place, regardless of where you work, regardless of what you're doing. Our daily responsibilities, whatever they may be, going to the post office, going to, to, to get you know uh, something at the store, uh, cleaning the house, cooking dinner, whatever. All of that can be a blessing when we see and we do it for God and we do it as an act of worship and we do it in conversation with Him. Driving our kids to school, school itself. Okay? How many people on this earth cannot read? How many kids on this earth don't have an opportunity to go to school? Uh, being able to go to school is a blessing in a place where we can glory. And, and you can take this forever. But you say, well, how do you do this? You let your work become prayer, prayer in action. It's not just that you talk, okay, but even what you're doing. Let it become a prayer. I'm doing this for you, okay. Uh, I, I don't really know necessarily specifics of some of your jobs, but let's just say you're typing. You know, you have to type reports all the time. Instead of, ah, I hate this, I hate this, I hate this. Type it as if Jesus was going to read it. You don't even have to say anything. If you do it with that heart, you are communicating and connecting with God. And I'll just say this, and you'll become a whole lot better worker if you think of it that way. No matter what our job or task may be, we can offer it up to God as an act of prayer. 1 Corinthians 10.31, and I, I mentioned this earlier, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do it all. Again, how? Let your work become prayer and action, and you don't need a break. 
You don't need a break uh, with our life and with prayer. You don't fast from prayer. You continually, your whole life becomes prayer. And you can do almost anything to the glory of God. Almost anything. You can't sin to the glory of God. Okay? But you can do almost anything to the glory of God. Prayer only makes sense when it's lived. Life and prayer must be integrated and not separated. Again, we want to get that 5% up. Okay? Now, you're not going to get it at 100% starting tomorrow. But tomorrow is a new day. And actually, tonight is a new, a, a, a new opportunity. The work of our hands and of our minds can be acted out in prayer, an offering to Christ. That tomorrow when you go to work, you say, God, I'm going to work the best I can with the best attitude and the motivation I can, as hard as I can, and I'm going to give that to you as an offering. Try it. Just try it. Okay. How many of you have ever seen the movie Chariots of Fire? Oh, wow, y'all need to watch some more movies. You've got to watch Chariots of Fire. For one, the music is just awesome. Er Chariots of Fire is a movie about Eric Little. If you don't know who Eric Little is, he was a guy from Scotland, and he could run really, really fast. And during the Olympic Games, they scheduled his uh, run on a Sunday, so he refused. Now, because and, you know, the, the people were really upset, hey, you know, you're, you're, you're supposed to win. How in the world? He said, I will not run on Sunday. And uh, they, move him, they move him to another competition, and he still wins a gold medal anyway. And then he ends up going to China as a, I mean, Japan, no, China as a missionary, and he's killed by the Japanese in a concentration camp, actually in the province that Carrie and I lived in in China. Uh, but anyway, in this movie, uh, if, if you haven't watched it's a really good movie, when he runs, his, his sister's always giving him a bunch of junk because he's supposed to become a missionary. He's supposed to, and you're like, oh, stop all that running and stop all that, you know, get, get back into church and, you know, don't, don't worry about all that. You, all you, you, need, you need to start focusing on the mission. And he says, but when I run, I feel God's pleasure. That is an example of praying in the ordinary. That he felt the pleasure of God as he ran. Why? Because he ran not for Scotland or for Great Britain. He ran for God. Everything we do. Everything we do. This is true no matter what our occupation. This is true no matter what the activity now, it's hard for us to see running in, the, you know, running in the Olympics and Michelangelo painting and pastors and missionaries. Oh, that's easy to see that, doing that for God. Now, that's easy. You know, I can, I can see if I was running in the Olympics, yes, I'm doing this for God. Or I'm halfway around the world serving or Michelangelo, you know, painting the Sistine Chapel. I'm like, oh, you know, I, but what about cleaning a toilet, cooking a meal, mowing the grass? Yes. That, too, can be for the glory of God. In fact, I think it's in the ordinary, boring, mundane things in our lives that we will find God the most and where we will miss him the most. And if you're not looking for God in the ordinary, oh, you're missing him in most of your day. Because I don't know about you, most of my days are pretty ordinary. Uh... I mean, even when we were halfway around the world, things become ordinary. You know, it became ordinary for us to go to Dubai Mall. It became ordinary to, you know, drive by the Persian Gulf, which in the Middle East is actually called the Arabian Gulf. Only Iranians call it the Persian Gulf. Uh, it was ordinary for those things. I remember, you know, I think I've shared this before, but when we were in China, and right before we left China, I was going around taking pictures of, you know, things that I, I wanted to remember and things that stood out. And there was this guy, every day for five years, he came to our school and sold goat head for lunch. I mean, literally. So he'd have four or five heads, and he'd scrape the facial tissue off in a little plastic bag and sell it to the students for lunch. And I remember walking right past him thinking, that's ordinary. <laughs> you know? Because I'd seen it every day for five years. And then I find out, oh, no, i got to take a picture of this guy. And then he popped out the eye and ate it while I took a picture. Uh, but it's a thing of, if we're not careful, we're missing God all day long because we think he's not there. 
but he is. I mean, what we talked about with our union, in, you know, union with Christ, he's everywhere. He's in us. So he's with you at Walmart. He's with you at the job. He's with you in the commute. He is with you. And that's where we will see him the most or we will miss him the most. We don't need to have a good feeling or great excitement to do things for God. We just do it for him. Okay? It doesn't mean you go to, you know, you go to work tomorrow, yay, I'm working for him, because they'll probably fire you. Uh, but it's a thing of, God, this job challenges me in many, many ways. The people I work with challenge me in many, many ways. But I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to work hard, try to keep a good attitude for you. And I'm only going to do it for you. I'm not doing it for a raise. I'm not doing it for a promotion. But if you bless me in that, great. But, you know, I'm, that's not why. I'm going to just try to do it for you. Try to do it for you. Okay? And some days you'll fail. But God will see it. All good work is pleasing to God when it's done for God. Okay? Now, wouldn't you like to walk out of your job tomorrow knowing my boss might hate me, <laughs> but my, my heavenly father is pleased that today I honored him. Today I did this for him. And God's looking down on me. I can tell you, uh, you know, as, as the pastor of the church, when I can walk out of here on Sunday, you know, when I did the best I could do, and I believe I communicated what God wanted me to communicate, and I believe God's you know, pleased with me, there's no feeling like that. Okay? It's, it's a thing that we need to have that in every aspect of our life. But it's not necessarily goosebumps or anything. God values the ordinary, and God is pleased when we do it for Him. Okay? Any comments or questions? Or any examples of the little things that God has cared about in your life? Yeah. Amen. Uh, for those online, Penny's talking about even shopping. Like even if you're shopping for someone, uh, why not pray about it? I mean, when I was when I was, you know, it, it's sad to say. I, I went to three Christian schools. I went to Lee University. I went to Wheaton College, and I went to the Assembly of God Theological Seminary, which now is part of Evangel. And not until I got to Evangel did my teachers ever say, "Hey, you know, all your papers and stuff you got to write." Ask for God's help. And honestly, I mean, I, 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 I'd spent seven years in college before that, and I thought, wow. I mean, it was like you, you thought that would have occurred to me before, and it didn't. And I started praying, God, I need you to help me with my topic. I need you to help me to write better. Help me to write the best I can. And I believe my writing got better. Little things, all, everything in our life. Why shouldn't we include God in academics? Why shouldn't we include you in God in shopping? I mean, I'll say this, and <laughs> those who got the gift might disagree with me. I gave the board a, a gift for Christmas. I prayed about it. I prayed a long time about it because I'm really picky when I give a gift. I want the gift to have something to do with me and then something to do with them or you know, something that I want for them, and it's really, really hard for me. And I really, I mean, it's about the only thing I can kind of really say I really sometimes stress out about and because I want it to have meaning in that gift. And... Uh, and so the gift that I gave them is what, over and over again, I felt God saying, do that, do that, do that, okay? Why freak out over what to buy everybody? Why not pray about it, okay? <laughs> you never know. He might say, ah, I don't get them nothing. No, I doubt he'd say that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. 
Amen. Carrie. For those online, you can ask Carrie what she said. <laughs> but it's something just though occurred to me when she said that. You want to learn how to do this? Get a child. Follow a child around and how they take joy in everything. And see, I mean, because, okay, like, even here, uh, one thing that Leander and Kinder, I've noticed that they'll always notice is anytime we are leaving church, if there's stars in the sky. Why? Because for almost, you know, the whole time we were in Dubai, because of the city, the brightness of the city, and I think also because of the sand, you never saw stars. And so they're always, oh, there's so many stars, there's so many stars. And, and, and I think following the child around and how they just take such joy. I remember when Leandra <laughs> was little, it didn't matter what you gave her. I mean, it could be a big, nice toy or it could be a nothing. She, <gasps> I mean, she just has these over... And she definitely didn't get that from me. But it's a thing of, you know, just took such joy in everything. That's what it means if you don't have the faith as a little child. It doesn't mean that we're childish. But that when we go outside, we're like, oh, Daddy, this is amazing. Look how blue the sky is. Look how green the corn is. You know, I mean, I mean let's just be honest. When the corn is up and it's all green, it's beautiful. You know, it is beautiful. You know, and it's a thing of that we can so easily take all that God's given us for granted. And maybe what we're eating isn't what we want to eat or what we would prefer to eat, but we can still, God, that you provided me this meal. And you say, well, isn't that kind of fake? That's what I'm saying. At the beginning, it will feel that way, that you're pushing it. But eventually, you'll start noticing that everywhere you go, you see God. You can, you, can, you can hear him in the laughter of a child or a bird flying by. or you know, I, mean, I remember the first time in Dubai when we saw a cloud. It was six months before. And it, I mean, we were just sitting here taking pictures of a single little cloud. I mean, it looks like a cotton ball in the picture. You know, and, and it, we were like, because we had taken it for granted, being from a place where you see clouds all the time. And when we can do that and when we learn to do that, what feels awkward will become life. And then we start realizing that our 5% spirituality has increased. Right? Yeah, Jim. Say sixty. Yeah, I, we, need to, we need to be mature 
but in Christ we don't need to grow up. You know, we need to see our Heavenly Father for the wonder He is and take joy in all that He gives us and all that He provides and all He blesses us with. And, you know, it's easy to sit around and complain and gripe and, and you know, I mean, especially with the way the world is. It's, you know, it's easy, but there's still so much beauty, you know, in the world. And, uh, I mean, you know, one of the things that I, I have learned uh, I mean, in, 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 in the blessings of being an American, uh, I mean, I've been all over the world. I've been in six, over 60 countries, and I've seen just about everything historic you can see. I mean, the pyramids and the Great Wall and, uh, you know, stuff like that. Uh, but there's no country more beautiful than ours. And I don't say that because I am an American. It's just a fact. Uh, and the diversity of beauty in topography and you know, mountains and beaches and, and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and I think often we miss it. And you don't have to go to Colorado or, or Yosemite or the Grand Canyon to see it. You just got to open your eyes. I remember when we were in China, and I'll, I'll close with this. When we were in China, the, the, you know, China, everybody burns coal and uh, it's credi- it was incredibly, incredibly polluted and everything's kind of gray. And uh, I remember the first time we came back from China, we were in Alabama, and you know we had a you know camera. We always we we're always taking pictures, and we stopped at a cow pasture in Alabama to take pictures. I mean, you know that's scary because it was so green. Something I grew up seeing my whole life. I mean, that's where I that's where I was born. I mean, that's where I, my whole life is in that part of the world, and yet because I had it had been taken away for a year. I'm sitting there, I'm mean, taking pictures of cows in a, around a bunch of grass uh, because it was so beautiful. And, you know, and I think sometimes we need our eyes to be open. And, and that's also a prayer. God, not only help me to do things for you, help me to see you in everything. And I think that's a prayer God wants to answer. But we have to slow our life down enough to look and to see him. All right, let's conclude. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this night, and we do pray. We don't want to be 5% Christian. We want to be Christian in everything that we are, everything that we do, every thought that we have, every action, every reaction. We want to live for you. We want to see you in the big things of our life and the tiny little things because you are God of the extraordinary, but you are also God of the ordinary. And helping us to see you, open our eyes to see you in the ordinary. And this Christmas, you know, that many of us has had many, many of them. And we can sometimes miss the point, like Jim was talking about. But I pray that in the simpleness of Christmas carols being sung, or the simpleness of watching a child open a gift, or, or you know, eating something that we think is yummy, or just being around people that we don't get to see very much in our life. Whatever it may be, whatever we do, let us do it for your glory and to see you in the ordinary. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.